Thank you for joining the Florida Center for Students with Unique Abilities monthly informational webinar, Evaluation, beginning with the end in mind. My name is Drew Andrews, and I'm the Assistant Director and Technical Assistance Coordinator with the Florida Center for Students with Unique Abilities. Our presenter today is Dr. June Gothberg, Director of the Career Connections Research Center at Western Michigan University. Today's webinar is being recorded. The PowerPoint and other handouts can be downloaded from the chat section, which can be accessed by clicking the chat icon, which looks like a little speech bubble, down at the bottom of your browser window. If you have difficulty hearing the presentation, phone numbers that can be um, used to call and join the um, webinar via your phone will be shared, um, and you can follow the slides online. At this time, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Gothberg. Well, hello everyone. I am so excited to be here today to talk about evaluation. I got to meet a few of you at the Institute, but I don't know all of you. Um, I wanna tell you this is uh, informal in that if questions come up as we go, just tell me to pause and let's take them as they go. So I hope you are in a creative mood because I would like to take you on a journey today. Oop, my slides are not going forward. There we go. So I'd like you to take a minute and I would like you to clear your mind. I'd like you to breathe in deeply. And if you want to, you may even want to close your eyes. Now I want you to visualize two people are walking toward you and they're about a block away. At first, you can't see who they are. As they get closer, suddenly you realize it's one of your students. But it's not today, it's five years from now. Think deeply, what are you talking about with this student? What have they done over the past five years? What have they accomplished and how have you helped them to achieve it? If you actually played along, thank you, and you tried this exercise, you probably got an idea of what's the most important accomplishments that you'd like to see happen with your students in the next five years. Did you envision the person on the left holding the sign that's looking for a job? Or did you picture the person on the right that is in a nice suit ready to go to work. Think about that. Did you picture this student working? Did you picture this student living their life to the fullest out in their community? Did you picture the student maybe still learning? Maybe they're extending what they've learned in your programs. Perhaps you pictured the students talking to you about their hobbies and what they like to do for fun. Maybe you even pictured your students going on vacation and having fun with friends. Perhaps you pictured them talking to you about dating and maybe even marriage. And maybe you even pictured them talking to you about parenting. When you imagine these things, these are your longer term outcomes and maybe even the impact that you wanna make with your programs. This, is beginning with the end in mind. According to Stephen Covey, 
all things are created twice. First, they must be created in your mind, and then they're created in the real world. That is where, where we're starting our conversation today around evaluation. So now that you've had these great ideas in your head and you're picturing these awesome results for your students, you're probably saying, how do we get there? We have this vision, we have an end in mind, we know what we want, but what's next? And so we're, I'm gonna talk a little bit about a process. First, you need to assess where are we now? Then you have to create a plan Next, you'll have to act on that plan. And finally, you need to evaluate how you did. It's simply this little imp continuous improvement process of plan, act, and evaluate. It sounds really simple. However, there's a lot that goes into that, right? <laughs> so just remember, plan, act, evaluate. Fortunately, most of you were at the Institute a couple of weeks ago and you started assessing where you're at. For these programs, we have the four areas, the four buckets of where you can put your effort in order to get to that end in mind. So you may have looked at all four areas, you may have just looked at one in particular, but you should have gone through the process with your groups of looking at your current status in a domain and then discussing the benchmarks under those. Those benchmarks are the research-based practices that we know helps, helps lead our students to that end in mind. So there may be other things that you can do However, the things that are in this tool that you used are what we know works or has worked for other programs. So you can see here, I just pulled some examples. Do not call yourself out. <laughs> some of these you might recognize as your own plans. Um, I did not name names, but I, I pulled from some of the plans. And you can see as you went through that needs assessment, you asked yourselves, to what extent is this benchmark implemented? And then I always call this the how do you know question. What's the extent or quality of your evidence? Decided whether it was a priority and whether or not you wanted to develop a plan this year for that particular benchmark. The next thing that you did is you moved the ones that you wanted to create a plan around forward and you started that planning process. You started that planning process with a goal. You may have used one of the example goals or you may have created your own goal. Then you decided which strategies you were gonna use to get to that goal. And then you started creating a plan. The next thing you and your team probably looked at were the tasks that you were going to do in order to make that goal happen. You should have put down those tasks, a person who was responsible, and the project date that you intended to complete it. After that step, you will look at your outputs. We're going to talk about this a little bit in just a minute, but your outputs are those products, those tangible things that are going to come out of the action and task that you took. So here's that process just in a synopsis. You conducted your assessment of where you are right now, you started a plan, and you decided what actions. Simply put, this is your what. This is the what are you doing. You also then moved into what are your outcomes? Your outcomes are those short, middle, or long-term results that you want to see. When you decided what your outcome was, we also asked you to identify an indicator. So how are you gonna measure it? What's gonna indicate whether or not you actually met that outcome and your data sources. 
when you got to that point and you added in your evaluation, you could have just stopped with your what. So if you only evaluated the what, so you said, we will create a program. Yes or no, you created a program. If you only evaluated to that extent, you're only evaluating what happened. If you want to really get to those pictures I showed you and those thoughts about that end in mind, you want to get to the impact stage. So you need to get beyond just the what in your evaluations and move to that next stage of so what. So what happened because of what you did? In other words, did you make a difference? So instead of just checking the box that you completed something, did you make a difference? There's more to this process. So if once you're able to answer the what, what did you do? And then you're able to answer the so what, on that process of continuous improvement, now you can ask, now what? When you're asking that now what, you're asking what are our next steps? How do we improve? How do we grow? And how do we ultimately make an impact? Here are some ahas, because I looked at your plans. We read your plans and I looked at your plans Here's some of my overall ahas. One, almost all of you are capturing the what. You're doing a really nice job in that evaluation section on measuring the what. There are a few of you that are capturing the so what. Did we make a difference? Hardly any of you are getting to the now what. So that's what I really wanted to focus on today was getting to through that three-step process. And honestly, if you've never thought about it, that's what evaluation really is. It's looking at the what, the so what, and the now what. A lot of times we make it really complicated, but if you simplify it like this, then that evaluation component doesn't seem so intimidating. And you can move forward and identify some things that may be really important to capture. We look at it across this continuum. So we start with the evidence-based, research-based, best practices, whatever language you use. That's where you start. You create your goal, identify your task, identify your outputs, your outcomes, and your evaluation. Now, when I looked at your plans, the arrows on here are indicating there's some confusion. As I looked at some plans, you may have written a task instead of a goal. You may have written, written a task instead of an output. You might have put in an output instead of an outcome. So the big line shows that your goal should directly lead into that outcome. Now, because of that confusion, there was some confusion in your evaluations that you wrote. So I'm trying to get real and really look at your individual programs. Feel free, remember, to stop and ask me some questions if you have any. So first, I want to talk about this confusion between a goal and a task. And this is important because we got to get these steps right in order to really have rich evaluations and understand the program and what kind of impact you're making. So just very simply put, goals are those results of what you want to achieve. Tasks are the actions you're going to take to support your goals. So that's the difference is the goals are the results, the tasks are the actions. There also seems to be some confusion between those tasks, the outputs and the outcomes. So when we're thinking about that, outputs are those tangible items. And I always say, use your senses to identify 
outputs. Outputs are things you can see, touch, feel, smell, participate in. And they are the results of your task. You do a task and it results in an output. So outputs can be those services that you offer. It can be those products you create. It can be those events you implement. Outcomes are the end result. Those are the changes you expect to see. Now, I didn't put up your specific task, outputs, outcomes. I didn't want anybody to go, oh, she's picking on me. But when we looked through those, we saw a lot of these interchanged, which really makes it difficult for you to create a good evaluation to understand your programs, program improvements, and the impacts you're having on your students. So that's why the evaluation is circled there at the end. I get a lot of questions about evaluation. So some of those questions are around when should we do evaluation? Should we wait to the very end? Should we be doing it in phases? When should we be doing evaluations? Well, evaluation can happen during almost all the phases of your program. They are called two different things. There are formative evaluations and there are summative evaluations. Formative evaluations tend to be ongoing. Summative evaluations tend to come at the end. And so I have a quote for you because this is one way when I was first learning about all this that helped me remember the difference. So you have a cook that's in the kitchen and he's making some soup, he's at a restaurant. When the cook tastes that soup, that's formative evaluation because he can still make changes. He can still improve that soup for the customer to ultimately be happy. However, when that soup goes off out the door and the dinner guest tastes the soup, that's summative evaluation. So at that point, you can't put more pepper in. You can't cool it down. You can't add another ingre ingredient either. You've, you've met your goal of a really delicious soup or you haven't. I also get asked a lot about the how. And I will disclose right now, right up front, I am a believer of mixed methods. So when we think about the how, typically we think about quantitative data and qualitative data. I came into a couple of your team meetings. This came up a lot, um, just talking about that, that type of data and what you should be measuring or collecting in order to understand your programs. Your quantitative data tends to be based on numbers and percents. Your qualitative data focuses on words and experiences. I would tell you that the most informative evaluations usually include both. So you get an idea of the, the difference you make in numbers and percents, but you also capture that student story. And that will enrich your knowledge about what's working, what's not working, and why. There is a document in the chat box, I guess I call it a document, in the chat box that you can download and help guide you as you're thinking about your evaluations. And what I have done is just laid out a few different methods that are typical in these types of programs and what you use for data in order to measure and evaluate your programs. So in the first column, I, I share with you the method. In the second column, I give you an idea of how much prep time that will take because different types of data require different amounts of your time. In the third column, how long is it gonna take the participant to participate in this type of method? Then anticipated analysis time. So it may be that the prep time's low, the participant time's low, but your time in order to analyze this information is really high. And then I included a column on usefulness. 
and then also some information on how you could use this. As you look across this, you can see that things like attendance sheets and documents and checklists are really low prep time, low implementation time, low amount analysis time, but they're also on that lower level of usefulness. When you get down towards the bottom and you're starting to look at interviews, focus groups, testimonials, case studies, they're gonna take you more time. They may take more time to prep, more time to implement, more time to analyze, but the depth of information you get from some of those are really gonna inform you of how your programs are doing. What's going really well? What do you need to make sure you continue to do and replicate? What are maybe some things that aren't really doing much for your participants and you can walk away from that? So hopefully that is helpful. When we think about the design, one area that tends to go unnoticed and unthought about, even in the world that we're sitting in, we are in programs that are looking to be inclusive. Right? Everybody here has a heart for inclusion. It's important to you. But even in this world, often we don't think about what it takes to be inclusive when you're designing your evaluations. So if we want to get rich data that guides your continuous improvement process, we need to make sure that our evaluations are accessible that our participants actually understand what we're asking or we're after, and that they can be used by all. So I'm bringing to you today something that's probably not typical in webinars that you go to on evaluation. And it is, um, uh, it started out as an idea that we conceptualized for the American Evaluation Association that we are now providing some guidance to the United Nations because they are wanting to include people with disabilities in their evaluation data collection. So we took this idea of universal design not to be crossed over into universal design for learning, but just that broad idea of universal design. So the universal design came out of architecture many years ago and it's looking at the design of products and environment to be able to be used by all to the greatest extent possible without having to adapt it or specialize the design and you may all be really aware of this but i just thought i'd put up the seven principles of universal design it includes things like equitable use flexibility making sure that what you are creating is simple and intuitive to use, that you have perceptible information, that there's tolerance for error. And often when we move into the world of something where we have assessments, there's not a lot of tolerance for error. So those are things to, to think about. Low physical effort and size and space for the approach that you want to use in the chat box <laughs> there is a download you can have this entire checklist um, i worked with you'll see if you download it you'll see um, i worked with uh, jennifer sluski at ici boston and we were on the fourth edition at the time that this presentation uh, was created. We are working on a fifth edition because we have a partner now that specializes in mental health and trauma. That, so we'll be adding a little bit to it, but I included in there the checklist for you to think about as you're designing your evaluations. <laughs> so you can just see on the sample page, there's some things we forget that are very simple to do that are on that checklist that we might forget if we're designing it. A few things that I have run across that seem to come up over and over in these inclusive type programs and settings that we tend to forget about are making sure that 
what we are asking participants to read, what we're asking participants orally as questions, that they're free of all that jargon and language. So we sit in these worlds where we have tons of acronyms, lots of jargon. We think everybody understands what they are, and they may not. So making sure that you're free from those, those acronyms and jargon. Often we're not thinking about colorblindness, and there are a lot of people who are colorblind. It is something like 8% of the entire world cannot see the color red. So as we're creating materials, as we're maybe we're doing a survey, even in, in the programs that we're implementing, we need to make sure we're thinking about making our materials accessible to people who are colorblind. Um, in many cases, our students don't even quite realize that they are colorblind. So that is something to think about. And then certainly with this particular population, when you create something they have to read or if it's questions you're even giving in an interview or a focus group make sure to run it through the word spelling and grammar and look at the grade level of reading that that requires for these type programs the recommendation is fourth grade and under so that, that's one thing to think about. Make sure that it's fourth grade and under. The other thing, I've talked to several of you, you're on black, so I can't exactly see you for most of you, but I talked to several of you at the Institute and you are also including parents in your evaluation efforts. I would suggest you keep the reading levels lower for them as well. So think about that, I would not, go above a sixth grade level if at all possible but you might want to keep it simpler than that also for student students that really have some difficulty and challenges don't be afraid to use pictures as a way to respond so if you're giving them some sort of survey some sort of tool you can certainly use pictures in order to collect that data and just take that stress off of it Make it more simple and flexible. You'll get better data. Those are those are just some suggestions. June. Um, yes. Um, Nicole, you can decide if you want to talk. And Nicole has posted a couple of comments. Oh, and, and I can't see the I can't see the yeah. chat, so I'll have to rely on you all. Nicole, Nicole, you yes. wanna you wanna ask? I, I um, June. It seems when you describe having. Um, individuals or students involved in the evaluation part that you're referring to particip participatory action research, right? Which is, and I wonder, I wondered if you've ever used this type of um, model before. And because um, we are going to start using the model starting in January um, with our students. Um, and I was wondering if you've seen success in using that model um, on evaluating programs like ours. I mean, we're using it, we're starting to use it for the other parts of Embrace, but we're looking at also using it for the, for the education program. Um, and I just wanted to get your feedback on it. I, I know that there are a lot of challenges, um, sure. you know, given the student's cognitive ability but I just wanted to get your feedback on the use of that model. Okay, good, good question. I, this all wasn't about necessarily participatory action research, and that is a term that maybe not everybody knows, understands, or doesn't understand fully. When you are looking at participatory, either research, evaluation, whatever you're doing, that means that your participants walk along beside you through the entire process from planning that evaluation to implementing it to analyzing and disseminating it. You can certainly do pieces and components of that, but if you're doing the true model of participatory, I'm going to call it evaluation because we're talking evaluation here. Um, if you're going to embrace that fully, then you need to bring on 
people that represent the population that you will be evaluating to be part of that whole planning team. One of the things that I had shared, and I, I think Nicole, it was with your team. Um, I've seen this, I've just seen some incredible things happen in this type of an area. The state of Maryland, their uh, Department of Health and Human Services decided to do a client evaluation and they hired uh, Gordon Bowman to come in and do that. Uh, I was fortunate enough to be able to watch that happen and go through, you know, go through that brainstorming piece of how do we do this. And what they did is they hired individuals with intellectual disabilities as their um, as their moderators for their focus groups and their interviews. And they didn't have anybody else in the room. So that the interviewer and the interviewee were quite a bit alike. They might not have been 100% alike, but quite a bit alike. And in order to have that happen, they had to bring people into the project before they ever even thought about what questions they want to ask. So they had to come through the whole planning process. I believe in all, and they paid them, I believe in all there were 25 adults with intellectual disabilities that were hired to be a part of this evaluation plan. Um, Drew, if you will keep me honest and write a little note and email me, I will, there was an article that came out. It's not the full evaluation, but there's an article out. Um, if you email me, I'll send it to you. You can share it with a group. Thank you. So that um, was one example of participatory. We are, we are looking to use alumni mm -hmm. um, to help create the questions and help be part. And of course, they'll be paid. This is, you know, um, and help be part of the evaluation team to actually roll this out. Um, I'll, I'll um, let Janice and everyone know we, we are actually using this model with folks from Israel who've been writing about this model in this area for a while. So they are helping us formulate this. I'll, I'll, I don't know if it's gonna work, but I was just wondering what your experience might have been with this particular model for these types of programs. Well, we're we gonna give it a, a shout, a, a try Yay. in January. <laughs> well, you have to come back and tell us how it goes and what your lessons you learned. That's what's really important. What lessons do you learn? Because not everything's gonna go perfect, Nicole. And so you'll have, you'll have some advice for all of us. Um, but you don't have to be doing a full participatory project in order to implement universal design. Universal design is just really useful to help you think through how you're setting things up. Um, for instance, if your participants are, if you're going to do interviews or focus groups and they need transportation to get there, are you making sure that the time that you're scheduling aligns with the bus route or whatever kind of transportation they're going to get? Are things readable? I tend to, um, a lot of times, I tend to, if I'm going to do an interview or a focus group, I give them either a sheet of paper that has the questions on it so they can follow it, or I put it up on the wall with a projector so that they have multiple ways in order to understand the things that I'm asking them. If you're doing a survey, is it readable? I definitely would encourage you to pilot instruments and things that you develop to collect your evaluation data before you use them for real. Pilot them with your participants, with their friends, um, whoever you can find that you can actually try this out and make sure that what you're doing gets you back the data that you need in order to understand how things are going. And then I talked about the, the color blindness, but also think about low vision. Okay, so I am, um, I'm gonna stop for just a minute and I would love to hear, I'm sure some of you 
have ideas going or you're thinking, this is a lot, I'm not sure how I would take that uh, big checklist and we'll put it there and make a really good evaluation using seven principles. Um, ask me some questions and tell me your thoughts. Remember that all you have to do is unmute yourself, which if you just move your cursor to the top right of the window where your name appears, you can unmute yourself, or if you'd rather type your question, feel free to do so in the chat box. Is there any way to zoom in on that, that uh, chart there? To I can't really read them. Um, it's in the chat box, so you can you can have a I gotta find the chat box. Um, I think it's in the chat box for download. Yes, so, it's yes. there. Yes. Can you see okay. it, Kelly? Yeah, I have downloaded it. I just didn't want to switch screens, so <laughs> understood. I I actually didn't think about showing the whole thing. I didn't want to be totally overwhelming, but um well, it's not letting me download it. I have to go find it if I'm going to show it. So give me just a second and I'll go find it. Because <laughs> um, we can walk through it a little more. I, I didn't want to be exhaustive of that. Um, I can give you a few tips to, to get you started thinking of things that we've done in our evaluation work. When we were conducting focus groups where we knew that several of the participants were going to be on the spectrum. I gave them a just a one page handout that had clocks on it. And the clock showed about how far along we were in that interview process. So next to the clock, I had a question so that they could kind of time and gauge how long it was going to take for them to work their way through the interview process. I'm having trouble Drew multitasking so that I can get the, so I can get the uh, checklist. Don't worry, got it pulled up now. Well, I mean, I don't mind walking through it and talking about it a little bit. We have, we have some time. Um, as I'm doing that, most of you've created a plan and you've started some evaluation work and maybe this triggered some questions. Maybe you're not sure if you're only measuring the what or and you don't know how to get to the so what. Um, maybe you have something you're really proud of you want to share with everybody. June, I do have it pulled up if you want me to share my screen. Yeah, why don't you share your screen because I'm just not multitasking well okay. <laughs> trying to keep my presentation up and okay can you all see that okay okay so as you're we'll walk through it a little bit as you're thinking about principle one which is equitable use is this design useful and when you're thinking about that most of you probably don't have to go the informed consent route because you're you're implementing a program and you're just doing program evaluation. But when you are thinking about it, are your materials accessible? Do they represent those that you are evaluating? So if you have, um, when you're thinking about that equitable use and you think about your student participants, is the language are any pictures, anything that you're using representative of them? So do they look like them? Do they act like them? Are they in the same kind of setting as they would be? That would be something you could consider under the principle one. Flexibility is incredibly important because you are working with quite a range of individuals. So are you giving them something that is so rigorous and such a high standard that you can't flex it at all? Or are you being flexible to those individual needs? If something comes up, can you quickly adjust it? 
So let's say that um, you've decided you're going to implement, I, I don't know, some sort of high stakes assessment that's timed. And your participant really needs to go to the bathroom in the middle of it. Is there any flexibility for that to happen? Perhaps um, you're in a situation where communication might be a barrier. I'm not sure. Do you have a way to be flexible with that? Are there any kind of cultural practices that you need to observe? So thinking about those, um, the simple and intuitive, if I picked up your tool, so you're going to do a survey, let's say you're doing a survey, and I look at it, am I very quickly able to understand it without having to read every single word? That would be the ideal. Um, does it provide you ways to or does it provide them ways to communicate their preferences and their needs? Um, we talked about that reading level. It's very easy to use Microsoft Word and check for that reading level. And I would encourage you to do that every time. When you're talking about per perceptible information, think about those sensory issues. I know a lot of you have students that may have sensory issues. If you have ways to accommodate those sensory issues to increase how comfortable it is for them to participate, that would be ideal. When you're thinking about your printed publications, are they perceptible? So there may be instances you do need to include pictures. If it's online, I'm still shocked at how many things are offered online and are still not accessible to screen readers. Still, I, there are so many things. So make sure we have to model this. We, we are the people that are the experts in the field. So we need to model this or it's not gonna happen with our colleagues. Then that principle five, that tolerance for error. I, I already said that um, you should pilot test things and make sure they work, but what if you uh, get somebody that doesn't understand it and does it a little bit wrong? Does it mean that everything throughout this data collection process is going to be dropped and wrong? Um, are there options if you're doing, let's say you are doing a survey, whether it's with parents or students or other faculty, are there options to stop where you're at and come back later? Because that is one of the biggest reasons of non-response in surveys and things like that is because people have something come up and they leave and they aren't allowed to return to it. Mm -hmm. So think about your instruments and whether that availability is there. Think about the time it takes also in the things that you're doing, because sometimes we want to know the whole wide world. And I have seen some interviews that have 25 or 30 questions. I have certainly seen some surveys that are nearing 100. Those do not leave much for time for people to have any kind of error. And that principle six, it definitely increases the physical effort. So thinking about those things, do you really need an interview with 25 questions? Or could you have five questions and probe a little deeper? Do you really need an instrument that's a survey with 50 to 75 questions? Or could they truly be answered in 10 to 12? So think about that physical effort piece. Make sure you allow times for breaks. Um, have multiple sessions. If you have students that tend to get tired easily and you want to do an interview with them, break it into two interviews. Interview them on one day and have them come back another day. Um, provide comfortable seating. That seems silly, but I, there's so many times that we, even in the classroom, have students in such uncomfortable chairs that it's really hard for them to um, be comfortable and learn a lot. Um, we talked about the, the bus line and things like that. And then make sure you have enough size and space for what you want to do. And then I have some, some different things down there you can think about. That is the basic overview of that checklist. 
they seem like they should be intuitive because we do this all the time. I have found it is not. So it's really nice to just set this alongside of your planning tool as you're thinking about things or if you're developing some sort of instrument or survey or um, interview and just think through that. Um, another thing to think about is devices in this day and age. We're online. We're doing a lot of things online. Making sure your device, that whatever you're doing is accessible to all kinds of devices. It might work beautifully on a computer. I have learned in my own teaching efforts, I have had several students at the PhD level that when COVID hit, I'm going to hold it up. This is how they participate in my online class. And I actually have had five students who had no access to a computer. They are PhD level students and they are taking, writing their essays on this little device, logging into Zoom on this device. So if you're in that situation, you either need to think about it and plan for it, or you're gonna lose information that you might need to have. Okay, so we are at June, about 12 I, more minutes, so I, yes. I have, a, I have a quick question on okay. surveys. We do a lot of surveys for you know, very different things. Um, one of the things that I don't know how to overcome this is this whole desire by the students, particularly in the pre, to be able to say that they can do these things, right? Um, so we have independent living um, seminars and we do pre and post. And it could be simple things as, um, have you gone to the grocery and buy whatever? Have you ironed, use an iron, an iron before, wash clothes, simple, simple things. So it's not about the student's ability to understand what you're asking. Um, and then when we put the student in a situation where they have to demonstrate the skill, Mm -hmm. um, they clearly, they had no idea. Uh, they don't know how to do it. Um, and, and we also get observational surveys back from parents where parents tell us how well they do a skill. But I find that parents really want to say that their son or daughter is doing well. And we, you know, they rate them much higher than we would on a skill. And I, I wonder if there is anything, any recommendation you could provide, um, any insights into that? How can we mitigate those kinds of responses? That's a great question. I think my colleague Jennifer Coyle's on here. Um, Jennifer and I had worked in several states and implemented the AIR for self-determination. And what we found was the error requires that the student responds, the parent responds, and the teacher responds. And there was no alignment. Jennifer, you're welcome to speak to this. Um, I, I'm thinking really of the one we did in Arkansas and that, that struggle with alignment because out of the three, actually the students were the hardest on themselves. I'm just you know, ad-libbing here, they scored themselves much lower than their parents or their teachers, but nobody agreed. So if you line the data up, it just, it didn't seem reliable in any way, shape or form. And, and I'm not saying that that's a bad tool. The error is not a bad tool. It's just this idea of self-report is so difficult to depend on. It's not that reliable. I would suggest if you're really trying to get to the heart of this, most people do have a phone with a camera. And instead of asking in a survey question, can your child do this, this, and this, or to what level can they do this? And asking the student, can, to what level can you do this? Have them video themselves as the pretest. Have the parent video them. Say, could you create a one minute video and of your, um, your child doing laundry. And that'll give you probably a better idea than this. It's gonna take longer to go through that information. It is. When you're trying to do observation, you're trying to translate observation into that type of a one to five scale 
it's going to take a little longer, but the integrity of your data is going to be so much higher. So I would suggest with that, less is more. Figure out those really important skills you want to know about and observe those in some way. It doesn't mean you have to be live. You can have them actually, and some students might do it for themselves. And, might, and I would assume we would have to do some training with the, uh, the observer from the team to make sure we have inter-rater reliability. I would assume we would have to do something because it would be, we've got a few students well, and so we would have different staff observing I, I would, is that correct? I honestly think you could, it depends on what you're doing. Okay. But if you um, task analyze something and you were to, I, I just, I'm just taking your independent living because that's yeah. what you brought up. Yeah, that's what and we, um, your task, anal, you have a, a list of a, a task analysis of what it takes to do this skill. I don't really think you have to worry so much about inter rater reliability. You just have to have somebody observe the video and check. <laughs> Yes, they, you know, they, they turned the dial to this to start the laundry machine. They yep. put in all whites and they didn't mix it with colors. They, whatever it is you're trying to assess in your task analysis. Okay. And then that allows you to understand what additional things they need to learn. Okay. Thank kind of you. like a, you know, on, a, on the job training works somewhat the same way too on the VR side is they're looking for specific skill sets that a person has in their job and they'll go observe and it's more of a yes or no or it might be a scale of doesn't do it at all does it partially can fully do it fully independently amanda do you want to ask your question um or would you prefer i read it sure i just posted it in the chat box but i guess for the group or any other comments about if programs use other departments like their department of effectiveness to help with data or I guess do the program coordinators or other program staff actually do the data collection? That's a great question. I'm going to let your peers answer that because that really sounds like a question for your peers. We use um, graduate assistants and they are a task to an evaluator, faculty evaluator that's separate from the team. And it's in a different college altogether. Look at it, who else is on? We have Michael and April, Katie, Marissa, Lori, any of you wanna respond? Who collects your data? Janice and Drew, I don't know if you have some of that that you know about. Looked like Michael was about to respond. In a, oh, I'll good. Yeah. Uh, in response to the question of who collects the data, um, it also falls to the question of um, what's the data set that we're trying to collect? Um, I think in a good program of Al, um, not quite, but almost the more the merrier. Uh, if you, and when we've got more um, respondents, we're going to have different sets of data and help then ultimately that'll help us resolve discrepancy. Because I, if I have, you know, a, a single source of data is going to give me a single source of observation or opinion or um, perception. Uh, whereas if I have multiples, I'm likely to get discrepancy and then I can go about figuring out what I'm really seeing uh, because I've got not everybody seeing the same thing. Great. That's exactly what I want to see so that I can resolve it a little differently. So I, I don't like the idea of, I know in, in, in years past of program evaluation models past, um, it, was, it was a pretty big deal to contract out a third party evaluator who would do the entire eval for, for folks. And you know, that has a certain uh, appeal for um, um, efficiency, but I'm not sure it always gives me the right perspective because I'm not getting enough different ideas and views on it. Um, 
so uh, you know I'm, I, I know that sounds kind of hypothetical but um uh, who collects the data depends on what questions i'm asking and um uh but with toward the principle of more people collecting different types of data i'm i'm happier with my eval Good answer. Um, we have talked with a couple teams a little bit about having that external eye. I wouldn't suggest that's all you have. Michael, you kind of brought that up, like not just farm out evaluation. However, sometimes having an external, somebody external to your program come in and do a part of your evaluation, you're, you're immersed in it. And sometimes you miss things. Agreed that an outside person might be able to help with. So yeah. that, 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 that can be helpful. Um, but with that said, if you are going to try to do something like that, I would suggest you really need to make sure who that person is and that they understand your participants. You know, they have some sort of understanding. It would be, I think it would be incredibly difficult for just, um, another department, Amanda, that's used to doing evaluation of typical university programs to come in and really understand what you're doing. Maybe, but I just that that would be one thing to think about when you're thinking about somebody else coming in and giving getting your data for you. And Amanda currently, to our knowledge, that no, um, programs are not pursuing other departments to conduct their own their evaluations. They're doing them themselves. So they've, they've built their team where the evaluator is on the team and that's how they're doing it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, we are, I'm gonna share my screen again, Janice, so I can close out if that's okay. Yes. Uh, around the corner. I don't. Are you are you seeing my screen or Janice's? We see yours. <laughs> okay, it's on the evaluation checklist. Just making sure. Design. Okay. Yeah. All right. There we go. So I wanted to close with um, some information out of a book that I read many years ago, but I think it is so spot on that I actually bought it and sent it to Janice. <laughs> Thank you. But this, this idea of why is evaluation important? And this comes from Osborne and Gabler, I think 1985, on, on the role of evaluation in government programs. And these are actually their chapter titles, but I think it's just beautiful. So the reason why evaluation is important is because what gets measured gets done. And if you don't measure results, you cannot tell success from failure. If you can't see success, you can't reward it. If you can't reward success, you are probably rewarding failure. If you can't see success, you can't learn from it. If you can't recognize failure, you can't correct it. And the most important piece is if you can demonstrate results, you can win public support. So as you're thinking about evaluation, it can be difficult, but I feel in this instance, in these programs where you have legislative support, it is so imperative to make sure you can demonstrate your results. So thank you so much for all your hard work. And we're here if you have questions. So we'd love to help you create the best evaluations you can. Right, Drew? Right, Janice? Excellent. Yes, most definitely. <laughs> so true. <laughs> um, Thank you so much, June. And, and I see um, Amanda has a question to the group. Okay. Um, if there is time, can we share about cohorts of students, grouping students who are in the same track or same year of progress in the program? I, 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 think, I, I think I need to understand the question a little more. 
I actually can't see the chat. Or so like the idea of, you know, we track students when they are enrolled in the program, like tracking students in the same cohort, or if they have different exit points, is it better to like keep them in the same cohort for evaluation and reporting? Or like if we have a student who like takes a summer course, while another student doesn't, it kind of throws off our like timing for reporting throughout the semester and throughout their time in the program. You're gonna love my answer, Amanda. It depends. Oh. <laughs> it really depends. It depends on, on, on what you're planning to do for evaluation, what you're trying to measure. So if it's a cohort situation and you're trying to measure cohort results, you probably need to keep your results within the cohort. But if you are looking at individual student outcomes, then you could look at those individual students. So it's all about that planning piece. It's all about doing what you said you were gonna do in your, in your plans and in your applications and in your proposals and everything else you do for this work. Um, it, you certainly could write an objective of the cohort will rather than the student will. But I, it, it really, I think it's gonna depend. I will also say Janice and Drew might have some insight into that for their needs. And that grouping the students according to their tracks, that's some valuable information too, Amanda. So again, it is, um, if you wanna emphasize how students are doing with the, you know, within a certain concentration education, I'll just use as an example, um, whatever their um, mm -hmm. credential track is, that maybe you want to group them that way, regardless of which cohort they came in. And as you're, you're talking about the results of that, that concentration, is that what you were thinking about when you said grouping students who are in the same track? Because we could certainly tease that information out when we're looking at your student information when you do your annual report. We could certainly tease that out by their concentration or track and or by their year um, of completion. And some of that may be incredibly interesting, Amanda, mm -hmm. to look at. And I don't know if you're offering different programs and credentials. I'm not sure how you're set up, but it may be that students on one track for one type of credential have incredible employment outcomes, but the other ones are lagging behind. That would be really interesting to know across groups. Mm -hmm. But I, I also think it's important to capture that individual student success as well. True. So you'll probably have a little, I would assume most of you'll have a little bit of both. I think the question is we're debating whether or not to have if students want to take summer semester, because then if like there's a cohort of three students who have entered the program at the same time, one takes summer, the other two don't, like kind of how it throws off their progression as a group, learning the same things at the same time, progressing through the program, and then graduating at different times and following up with them on, I guess, different schedules or different time frames. Kind of sounds like any student in yeah. college, you know, I mean, when, <laughs> when I, that, I was thinking of, you know, it sounds like, although um, you're right. It's yeah. To look at, but Tracking it sounds the like student. Tracking the student and of course you'll have compiled data about what concentration they were in regardless of the terms they went, but when they completed, but tracking that student will give you that richness. Um, but yeah, that's, that's the beauty of what Michael has to track all the time in the department, isn't it, Michael? <laughs> when they come in, when they finish, what they, you know, what other additional education they wanted, blah, blah. So, um, those are great questions. Amanda. They are. They are. Thank you. Are. Other questions. So there's one thing we'd like to ask. Um, we are looking at trying to create some sort of a toolkit 
where we share tools that you could use based on those different research-based practices. So they'll be housed under those. And I always think that you benefit the most from what you learn from each other. And so we would love it if you are already using some specific type of tool or protocol or instrument, something you're doing that you've written up for your evaluation. Um, if you are willing to share it and send it to Drew, we would love to be able to showcase them, you know, with your program and your name and then put them as available for others to adopt, adapt um, in different ways. So I can sit here and I can create all kinds of things, but I'm not there in the trenches with you. So it's, it's just really rich to be able to share amongst each other. So we would, I think, I, and I, I don't want to overstep here, Janice, but I think ideally we would like to have the toolkit out before the next institute. That would be superb. superb. So that, you know, you all have some, some things to look at and ideas, generate some ideas. Amanda posted uh, Casey Life Skills, which several institutions do use, yeah. Not sure we can put that in the toolkit, though. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but yes, you have to reference it. <laughs> sure. Okay. I want to remind everyone that speaking of evaluation, we have an evaluation <laughs> of today's <laughs> webinar, and the link is in the chat box. And so please do not, um, you know, leave. You'll be receiving an email tomorrow with a link to the recording to this webinar, as well as a link to the evaluation, but if you have time today, while it's all fresh on your mind and this great information that June has shared with us, thank you so much, Dr. Gothberg, for just such a practical and such a clear um, <laughs> presentation that really gave us some really, really very cool things. Um, the what, the so what, and now what, you know? And of course, whenever you gave the reference of, um, you know, formative and summative, I thought, you know, because at times I have to think for a minute, now is that formative or summative, you know, really, and the soup, I won't forget that, that's a, that's a great, <laughs> you know, and those are the things that we remember, so thank you so much for your thoughtfulness Absolutely. in your presentation. Are there any questions before we go? Okay, well, if we don't see you all before the holiday season begins and the new year is here. We do wish you a very happy holiday and a safe and prosperous new year as we enter 2021. Thank you all for taking the time today to join us and to um, participate in the webinar. Thank you all. Thank you. Be safe, everybody. Bye. Bye. <laughs>